All right, let's open our Bibles to 2 Corinthians, to chapter 5. And uh, the chapters that we're reading this week are packed with wonderful um, passages that would be um, perfect for zeroing in for Sunday morning or Wednesday night, just the way we've been doing it lately. And I had about eight or nine Bible studies ready for tonight, so... Um, if the first one goes bad, I'll, I'm switching. So if we move to another text, you'll know that I'm not happy. So, no, I think we got the right one. Second uh, Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 18, it says, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that Christ was, or that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you, Not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in an acceptable time I've heard you, and in the day of salvation I've helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We want to thank you, Lord, for this work of reconciliation that you have accomplished through your Son. We thank you that these very words that were written some 2,000 years ago, are just as applicable, just as powerful, just as relevant. The, when they came, you know, in the ink went on the paper, when Paul was writing, just as true now, just as needed now. Lord, this such a powerful, wonderful, amazing reality, and we recognize that, that we are, are in a, a wonderful and amazing time to be proclaiming the salvation of God through his son, Jesus Christ, and to be able to do it freely and to be able to share it with any person, Jew or Gentile, and know that the door is open, that the sacrifice has been paid for. And Lord, we want to be used by you in these last days, so please speak to us, please encourage us, please empower us by the Spirit to be your witnesses, and that we would carry on uh, this ministry of reconciliation, and we, we pray these things together in Jesus' name, amen. Well, this this particular passage of Scripture is just so significant, so key. Um, I remember when I was in Bible college, all the ministry major students all had to do, I think, three or four or five-unit module courses that made up the core of every ministry degree. So if you were preaching or missions or Christian education or whatever, youth ministry, I think there's another one. Then there was like you could have a mix and uh, uh, everybody had the same 20 units, though, these core classes. And one of those core classes was called the Ministry of Reconciliation. And we went through the New Testament and talked about it. It's such a foundational and fundamental reality. Uh, the church sometimes, as plain as this is, and as clear as it is, the church sometimes struggles uh, by, it loses track of the Ministry of Reconciliation. You probably have heard the phrase, the social gospel. There have been different times uh, in church history, and just take our country, for example. Let's not look at all of church history, just the history of Christianity uh, in the United States. And you could think of universities that were founded for evangelism, for the ministry of reconciliation. Uh, There's a university called Dartmouth that is in rural New Hampshire, and their charter is the same calling that was given to John the Baptist, a voice of one crying in the wilderness. And that school was founded for the evangelizing of the Native American people in that region. Uh, It doesn't really stand for that and represent that today. You guys remember the movie Animal House and the frat and the craziness? That was patterned after Dartmouth. Uh, they've, they've they've, They've had this reputation forever of being um, a party, you know, this place where you could go to party, a party school. 
But if you look at if you look at their little seal, you know you you'll see it, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. You know it's still a wilderness. It actually still is in a rural area, uh, but not so much a voice anymore. Uh, crying out, make straight the way of the Lord. And so if, if we don't just think of, of it in terms of this audience sitting here tonight, we would all, we're, I'm preaching to the choir, we all believe this, but this is, this idea, or I was thinking even in the context of my Bible degree and the family of churches that I was part of at the time and the desire of that university to, to try to have every ministry student coming out of the school have the idea that there are certain fundamental focuses or basic concepts that we just, we just don't deviate from. Uh, we are uh, be- very well aware that James said, pure and undefiled religion is this, that you visit orphans and widows in their distress and keep yourself unspotted by the world. We recognize that. Uh, Paul, Paul said when, the, when he met the uh, leaders in, in the book of Galatians in chapter 2, he says, I met Peter, James, and John, those who were reputed to be pillars. They gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. He said the only thing they said, because they had nothing to add to our message, the message of reconciliation, they just, they just said, please remember the poor. Just remember the poor. So we're not, we're not against social programs or ministering to people or loving on people or taking care of widows. Th- those, are, those things are all so, so important, and, and they're more important than us taking care of ourselves, right? But they're not more important than the ministry of reconciliation. It's first. It's the most important thing. It's the ministry that we have. Because you could feed the poor, and if you don't give them the gospel... You just filled their stomachs, and then they died at the end of their life, and then they were lost for eternity. And, uh, you know, the Bible warns the the watchman in the book of Ezekiel, if you see the danger coming and you don't warn the people, if you see that a judgment's coming and you don't warn the people, then then the judgment comes and their blood is on your head. There's an accountability that we have. And Paul's going to talk about it in this section. We're not going to look at it. It's it's right before this talks about giving an account to God, but uh, I don't really want to look at it so much from uh, this sense of negative responsibility, but this wonderful and amazing positive uh, look at it, the opportunity to be called an ambassador for Christ. So the idea of the text, verse, verse 18, and really the, the title of our message, the ministry of reconciliation, and the, the outline of the message is verse 18. Everything's of God, and so what? There's two things. He reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. And secondly, he's given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Two things have happened, Paul says, and God's responsible for both of them. He's done it. It's his idea. It's his plan. Number one, God has reconciled the world to himself through his son, Jesus Christ. God did it. It wasn't that God reconciled himself to the world because God didn't need to be reconciled. God didn't go anywhere. Uh, I think on Isaiah 53 is that famous passage that says, all we like sheep have gone astray. God doesn't need to be reconciled. We need to be reconciled to God. We're the ones that went astray. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every single one of us knows that we've done things that we ourselves knew we weren't supposed to do. You knew you weren't supposed to do it, and you did it anyways. Like, we're the ones that need to be reconciled because we're the ones, we sinned against ourselves. We sinned against our conscience. We've sinned against our families. We sinned against the people we, we profess to care about the most. We've sinned against them. If I'm going to be perfectly honest, my wife had bought some of these really great little chocolate-covered mint candies. I ate them the other day. It took me three days. I was eating them little. I was hoping she would like jump in, like notice that they were starting to disappear. She never did until after they were gone. I ate them all. She's the most important person in my life. I ate her candy. And if she doesn't hide it, I'll do it again. And I'll regret it again. <laughs> and I'll be confessing it next Wednesday. I heard her laugh a little bit through that mask. It came through. I was better than a... So... The point I'm making is this, that's a simple, silly thing, but all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We need to be reconciled with ourselves. We need to be reconciled to each other. We need to be, we need to be reconciled to God. We're out of whack. We're in the United States of America. We, we're out of whack in our country. Everyone knows and thinks racism, well, not everyone, there's some fringe wackos, but 
I think, I think the bulk of the country, everyone knows racism's wrong and bad. So why do we still have it? So we need to be reconciled. We're dead in our trespasses and sins. We're lost. We're self-centered. We're self-seeking. We don't know how to talk to each other. We don't know how to love each other. We don't know how to hear what someone's saying. We don't know how to listen. We're in the flesh. I mean, it's, we need to be reconciled. This, this statement of Paul is assuming that reality, and he makes this amazing, wonderful, which we call the gospel, this announcement of good news. God reconciled the world to himself. That we had gone, God didn't go anywhere. We had gone everywhere. We had gone everywhere except for where we were supposed to go, and God has provided a means by which we could come back to him. Aren't you glad God doesn't come and meet us and say, oh yeah, you're pretty messed up. I'm going to overlook it. You can stay messed up for all eternity. No, he intends that we're holy. He's going to, he's going to make us exactly like his son. If Those things that are in you right now that you see that are not reconciled to God, or you know, I know that Jesus is my priest. I know he died for my sins. We're going to look at the atonement in a, in a minute and, and, and try to you know, really emphasize it, remind ourselves we can know those things, but then we look at ourselves and we say, oh, I, I still don't do what I should do. I, I still struggle. I still have a battle within me. I don't want to, but I do. And God stands and says, I've reconciled you. I am reconciling you, and I will reconcile you. You're, you're reconciled. You're made right with God. You're declared righteous by the blood of Jesus, and there's a work of holiness that has happened, that is happening, and that will happen completely when we are out of these bodies and we're with the Lord. We're not expecting sinless perfection uh, while we're in these bodies. We're expecting a battle between the flesh and the spirit. The flesh and the spirit are contrary to one another. But we're expecting a victory because of this statement, because we're reconciled to God. The price has been paid and God's done it. God's reconciled us to himself. In verse 19, this, this little phrase, he says, that is, he's going to explain it or amplify it. He says, that, that is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, in Christ. And then the great statement of verse 21, God made him, this is how he did it, this is why it's in Christ, why God's done it through Jesus, this statement, God made him who knew no sin, to be sin for us. That's the atonement. God made him who knew no sin. Jesus was innocent. He'd never sinned. He'd never ever lied. He never cheated. He, it's not in him to be able to sin. He's a human being with human nature. But uh, his human nature, he, and he got from his mom. He's the son of God. He's the son of man. He's human and deity and this unique person. He's completely human, but he isn't born with a sin nature. So um, I used to tell stories about my kids. Now I'll tell stories about my grandkids. I have a perfect granddaughter who already has manifested that she's a direct descendant of Adam. She has a sin nature. Now it's a cute sin nature. And as a grandparent, I, I like her sin nature much better than I liked my children's sin nature. It's like, oh, look, I wonder what they're going to do about this. You know, it's, it's a whole different uh, thing. But... She's not even a year old, and, and her, she has a sin nature. She's not, I'm not saying she's a bank robber, but uh, she does have a sin nature. Jesus, when it says he knew no sin, it means he didn't, he didn't sin in his mind. He didn't sin in his heart. He didn't sin on the outside. He didn't have a sin nature. He had a human nature, a perfect human nature, like Adam or Eve before they sinned. He had a perfect human nature with no sin. Now, when we were born into the world, we were all born in sin. We were born with this sin nature, and our sinning has proven our sin nature, that we are direct descendants from Adam. But Jesus isn't born with that. He knew no sin. He had never sinned. He'd He'd never, he didn't fall for any of the temptations of the devil. He didn't use any of his power for himself. He didn't promote himself. He didn't do any of the things that, that human beings do. And yet, verse 21, the atonement, God made him to be sin for us. Something happens on the cross. 
God made him to be sin for us. We can look at some passages. If you'll turn back to Isaiah 53, we already quoted it once, but we can look at another couple of phrases here. Isaiah 53, verse 4, He is born our griefs. He carried our sorrows. We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we're healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all. If you look at verse 10, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, his soul will become an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. In verse 11, he, God, shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Peter writes and says, in 1 Peter, he himself bore our sins when he was on the cross. And Isaiah prophesied 700 years before the Messiah comes into the world that there's going to be a substitutionary atonement. This person who's going to come is going to bear the sins of all of us. Now, if, if I really cared about you and I wanted to bear your sins, and I, and I prayed and I said, Lord, I really care about my friend. I really don't want to see them lost, and I'm willing to be lost for their sake, and so I want to give my life for them. The Lord would have to say to me, you're already lost your life has no value as an atonement for them because you're guilty. And in my case, he would say, you're actually more guilty. You, you actually need a Savior more than they need a Savior if we're going to actually count up all the sins. But if, all, if, if it's just one sin that makes you condemned, then you're lost, then who's going to save any? Who, who could save anyone? You can't save yourself. You can't save anyone else. It would take somebody to come into the world with a human nature and never sin. And then take that holy, sinless life and offer it as a sacrifice. I love how Isaiah says it. It means so much to us. It says, God will see the travail of his soul. The writer of the Hebrews describes that travail by saying, Jesus tasted death for every person. Jesus tasted death for us. Do you know you'll never know the taste of death? If you've given your life to Jesus Christ, death has lost its sting you won't know the taste of it. We know a bitterness of death and a, and a separation and a pain and a loss, a sense of tremendous loss and separation and grief that we experience when our loved ones, we say they pass away. It's, like, it's, it's heartbreaking. It, you know, you, feel like you can feel like you lost a chunk of yourself. If a parent lost a child or you lost a spouse or a best friend, that, that there's a pain but it's the pain of loss. It's the pain of the separation of that relationship or that presence of that person in your life. That's not the pain. That's not the, that's not the pain of death. When, when Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15 and says, Oh, death, where's your sting? Grave, where's your victory? The sting of death is sin. You see, death has a worse sting than the separation of, of the relationship. The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. We're separated, to be separated from God, to be lost. And God would see the travail of his soul as Jesus became sin for us. Now, I've quoted all the Bible verses that I know on this subject already um, about the atonement. Uh, I personally uh, believe that, that there's, there's probably more to the atonement. Um, I just don't feel comfortable speculating about what happens on the cross or what does it mean. We even, I think Chris even sang one of the songs tonight of, you know, God looks away. Like, what does it mean? What does it mean that when Jesus is on the cross and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the travail of his soul, and he becomes sin for us, and he bears our sins in his body, and God lays upon him the iniquity of us all. And what does that mean theologically in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the three are one, and somehow the unique and only begotten Son of God becomes a sin offering and tastes death. If we define death as we understand it in the Bible, this ultimate death, the second death, 
as separation from God. How is such a thing even possible? I, have no, I don't have any idea. I don't want to try to imagine it in the sense that I don't want to go past what the texts say. I just believe it. I believe it and I accept it and I don't try to imagine it because it's not my sacrifice to imagine. It's my sacrifice to receive. I believe that there's been a sin atonement that was made and the righteousness of God now becomes ours because of what Jesus did for us. He became sin for us, and verse 21 says the, the, that's the, he takes away sin, and then he also gives us righteousness, the second part of the atonement, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. When God sees you in his son, Jesus Christ, he sees you as righteous. Now, there may not be many other people that see you as righteous, because maybe you don't act very righteously. But if you've given your life to Jesus Christ... The righteousness of God is imputed to you by faith in Jesus. It's not by the things that you do or by the things that you don't do. It's a gift. It's a gift of righteousness, imputed righteousness by faith. Now, Paul, we're in First and Second Corinthians, right? So you've been reading First Corinthians. Now we're reading Second Corinthians. You know Paul is talking about holiness in our chapters this week. Uh, he, in, in, in chapter 7 is this great section on holiness. The end of chapter 6 and into chapter 7. Paul's calling them to live a holy life. He's not, he's not talking about here uh, a message that releases you from holiness. No, it's, it's the opening to holiness. Now you can actually be holy. Now you can actually change. You can grow. You can let God work in your life. But we are given righteousness through the atonement. The forgiveness of sins and the righteousness of God, they come to us, and it's God who's done it. Verse 18, again, let's go back now, thinking of it in that context. Read the phrase in verse 18, the first phrase. All things are of God. What are the all things he's talking about? He's talking about the atonement. If I think about my salvation, I'd have to say, it's only because of God that I got saved. It was God who loved me. It was God who sent his son. It was, it was God's son who died on the cross for my sins. It was God who raised him from the dead. It was Jesus who raised himself from the dead. It was God. God did it. It was the Holy Spirit speaking to me, drawing me to himself. It was the Holy Spirit revealing the love of God to my heart that was hardened and closed and not open. It was God, the righteousness of God given to me as a gift. The forgiveness of God extended to me through the sacrifice of his son. In Christ, in verse 19, that God was in Christ. This happened in Jesus and nowhere else. The work of God through Jesus' death on the cross. Many places in the New Testament make this point very clear. You guys who know your Bibles have probably thought of lots of cross-references. I'll just remind you of one. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. See, Jesus didn't come into the world to live a holy life and say, here is the way that you live. Here's the holy life that I'm looking for. Here's the standard that I require. The law was preparatory, but that's the Jewish law, and I'm bringing in the new Christian law. And if you live the way I lived and you walk in my footsteps, then you might be able to one day know that you have attained salvation by following me. That's, that's not the gospel. That's just another form of legalism. Jesus came to provide a sacrifice for sins and to make it so that by putting your faith in him, you could be saved. And it was because of God's love. And so God laid upon him the iniquity of us all, expression of his love for us. It was God's love. The death of Jesus upon the cross. And that's why there's no other way to be saved. It's not popular, and it's never been popular. It's not popular today. If you go to work tomorrow and you tell everybody at work, hey, you know, we were talking about this last night. I just feel like I need to tell everybody. There's no way for you to be saved except for through Jesus. And if you don't believe in Jesus, you're going to be lost for eternity. You're going to go to H-E double hockey sticks and you start, you're going to have a war on your hands. Like people go crazy. People don't want to hear that. It, but it wasn't popular, you know, 2,000 years ago when Jesus died on the cross. It wasn't popular when Jesus himself said, I am the way and the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said it. It's his message. He's the Savior. The reason that he's the only way is he's the only atoning sacrifice. 
There's no other atoning sacrifice. You say, but I was born in a Muslim country, and I, uh, my passport says I'm a Muslim, and I have to follow Islam, and I have to pray towards Mecca, and I have to follow the dietary laws, and I need to be a good Muslim, and I have to do these things. And, and it's, it's so arrogant for you Christians to say that Jesus is the only way. Arrogance has nothing to do with it. It has nothing to do with it. It has everything to do with, I don't know any other sacrifice for sin. In Islam, there's no sacrifice for sin. There, there is no atonement for sin in Islam. There's your good works, your adherence to the tenets of that religious system. If anybody uh, in any religion has an atonement, um, I don't know of it. I know, I know that there are animal sacrifices. Uh, I know that um, the, every religion that I'm aware of, it, you have to do X, Y, Z, and you have to keep doing X, Y, Z. And if you do that, and generally there's a way for you to kind of at least manipulate that because part of the reward is being better than the rest of everybody else and getting a special robe and a special title and special something to let everybody know that you're, you've climbed the ladder higher. It's just like any other thing in the world. It's a religious system. But Christianity is remarkably different in that God says you will never make it. You could never do it. And I did it for you. It's a finished work. Jesus said, I'm the only way. There's no other way. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Peter, when he was preaching, and it wasn't popular when he said this, it would get him killed uh, if they would have enforced the law. He said in Acts 4, 12, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven that's been given among men whereby we must be saved. There's no other name under heaven that will save you. You say, well, wait a minute, I'm part of this religious tradition. I'm part of this religious system. But have you believed in Jesus Christ and received him as your Lord and Savior and, and you know that your sins are forgiven solely and only through him? And the rest of the stuff of this system is mumbo jumbo. It's just, it's control. Control people's lives. You want your loved ones out of hell? Give us money, we'll pray for them. We'll pray them out of hell. No, actually, they're not in hell. They're in hell's waiting room, and they can feel the heat. If you don't want them to go to hell, then you give us money, and we'll get them out of that place. Or any number of all kinds of doctrines all over the place. Every country and every place in the world, every time in human history. This work is, is so important. It's the atonement. It's a finished work. It's already done. Jesus did it. God and Paul's announcing it here 2,000 years ago, and he's telling them in the past tense, God's reconciled us. He was, doing, he was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. He's done this. This has happened. Verse 21, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. It's done. We don't, we don't present a message of salvation to people when we proclaim it that Jesus started it, and he gets the ball rolling, and now you, by your good works and your keeping tabs and your giving us money, or you go do this on our behalf, whatever it is, you know, that, that you're, you know, he started it, and now you do your things, and between what he started and what you do, then you, you bank the salvation. You know, and if you get enough points, then you'll make it. It's a finished work. It's already done. Now, you might say, well, Richard, like that's belaboring the point. It's not, because it, what Paul's saying here, these two thoughts, there's two of them, and they're directly connected. There's no other way. It's already finished. Jesus did it. It's his, it's his death for us. His, his blood takes away the guilt of sin. His righteousness is given to us. Because remember, verse 18 has two things that, that God's done. All things are of God. Well, Here's number one, he's reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. Number two, he's given to us the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of reconciliation, it's important for us to recognize that the atonement's already happened. We're not doing the atonement when we do the ministry of reconciliation. We're just declaring it. We're announcing it. We, don't, we didn't do it. It happened a long time ago. God did it. God was in Christ. God sent his son. Jesus did it. We're simply declaring what 
he did. And what an amazing thing to be able to become part of the work of God. I think that Paul's reminding these, these Corinthians because they're struggling with being influenced by the culture of status and knowledge. Well, I know this many things, and so that makes me better than the other people who know less than me. Remember, knowledge puffs up, he said in 1 Corinthians, but love builds up. They're struggling with the identity of what ministry is all about. That's why I think we get 2 Corinthians is so filled with this very powerful picture of what ministry looks like. And it's going to go right into the next chapter, right? Like right where we stopped reading, he goes right into a description of ministry. And it doesn't really sound like something you want to do. <laughs> so verse 4 of chapter 6, he said, In all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God, in patience, in much patience, in tribulations, in needs, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fastings. Like, well, how do I get out of this? <laughs> like, the Corinthians are, are, are struggling uh, by fighting with each other in their factions. They're, they're undermining Paul's authority. Some in the church, they don't want to respect him. They're, they've, they're misunderstanding grace. They're not seeing uh, each other in the right light in, in any way. And, and so Paul's trying to kind of just shake them a bit and, and just say, you have to think about this. Or what, what's really happening? And, and this is important because when we're preaching the gospel... We're not adding to the atonement at all. We don't have to. It's amazing. God's done it. What we're doing is we're declaring it. We're simply declaring it. God's given it to us. This is our ministry. We get to become part of the work of God. So it's not like, uh, well, I mean, I know, you know, in our society right now, the, the, the people who are most famous are athletes and um, actors and actresses, you know, like ce the celebrity culture. And so, so there's this idea of like a status and, a, and a, you know, this many people are paying attention to me or I have this many followers, or I have this many views, I have this many clicks, I have this many likes or whatever. Um, if you think about something that's radical, Paul says, we're sleepless, <laughs> we, we're in tribulation, we have to have a lot of patience. We don't have our needs met. They're beating us up. We've been in jail. We've been, like, we, like we're, we don't have anything that the Corinthians would say you should have as a measuring stick of success. But, but here's something that Paul has that he's encouraging the Corinthians for or into that, that you and I have that can set us free from a, a trap. And that is we get to be workers with God. You get to be working with God, part of the work of God. The same work that only God could do and that only Jesus could accomplish, you're part of it. You're, that, you're the next step. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. You're just the next step. You're you're not like five steps removed. And then there's the saints, and then there's the apostles, and then there's the council, and then there's the blah, 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 or whatever. And somewhere, like, when do we get to me? Like, we got to get past, you know, superintendent, and then we got to get down to, like, governor, mayor. Like, you're, like, you're going to be all down, down, down. Like, okay, average Christian, and then, like, subpar, uh, sub-average. Like, then somewhere I'm down. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. It's what he did, and he committed to us the word of reconciliation. That's pretty radical. He's given it to us, verse 18 says. He's given us this ministry. He didn't give it to angels. He didn't even really give it to Jesus. Jesus did the work, but Jesus called people to follow him. And then he said, I'm choosing you 12, and you're going to be my sent out ones. That's the word apostle means sent out, one who's been sent out. From the very beginning, when he was choosing his disciples, he's calling the 12, and then gives the great commission at the end of Matthew, go into all the world. It's not just for them, it's for the whole church. We're all connected in. We all have different parts of the work. We're not all apostles, but we all get to become part of this work of God. He's given this to us. In verse 19, he uses another word. At the end, he says, he's committed to us the word of reconciliation. He's handed it to us, literally. He's placed it. Here, it's yours. He's pulled his hands off of it. What am I supposed to do with this? It's your ministry. <laughs> it's 
It's a ministry of reconciliation. Don't you think you want to get Michael or Gabriel or one of the angels or somebody, you know, that could really do a good job? I want you to do it. You've been reconciled. You understand it. I want you to go tell people, announce it to them. Tell them. It's a, it's a, he's committed it to us. We have the message of reconciliation. It's ours. The end of verse 19, he's committed to us the word of reconciliation. It's a message that has to be shared. Now, we don't disagree with Francis of Assisi, the famous uh, statement that he made, preach the gospel. If necessary, use words. Now, what was, why did he say something like that? Well, because in his day, the church was corrupt. You could look at people who were supposedly believers in the gospel, and you could follow them around for months, and you'd never be able to tell they were a follower of Jesus. So we're not finding fault with his statement in the context in which he uttered it, because you could, you could say that you know, to any one of us and on a certain any time in the day, say, hey, you might want to use less words right now, especially less of those words, right? Like don't, that word that you just used when you hit your, your hand with a hammer is not going to be bringing someone to Christ. So there, you could say like, hey, if necessary, use words and probably just it'd be better right now to just live like a Christian and build trust and, and be a good example so that this, these people have all, this, this guy's, Dad cheated on his mom and they were Christians. This person was homeschooled in a Christian family and the parents were total hypocrites or, or some kind of a thing like this. They were in a church and they were molested or the, and the church covered it up or, you know, um, the things that people go through. You, so so we, we don't find fault with what Francis is saying, you know, whatever, however many years ago, like 1,500 years ago when he said that. Preach the gospel. If necessary, use words. Having defended him, having stated that, he's flat out wrong. <laughs> you, can't, you can't preach the gospel because the gospel is a message and preaching is a verb that means to declare it. So if he says, preach the gospel, if necessary, use words. No, Francis, it's always necessary to use words. So I don't want to take away from what he's saying because we need to have, our, our lives have to match what we're saying or who's going to take you seriously, okay? So, but I've heard people justify their not wanting to open their mouth and share the gospel and use that quote and say, if necessary, use words. And I've managed to never use words. <laughs> like, well, I don't know. That's something to be really proud of. No, you need to share the gospel. You need to bring a word of reconciliation. Find a way to share a message of reconciliation, a message of hope, a message that God wants to have a relationship with somebody, and he's provided the means so that no matter how messed up you are, how sinful you are, you can have an approach to God. God's committed this to us. I've often wondered this, and I, I don't have a satisfactory answer, except for the principles that are revealed in the Bible, especially in 1 Corinthians, where Paul says God uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. I don't really understand why God doesn't use angels. When they show up in the Old Testament, they freak everybody out. They're so powerful. Uh, I, would just think, I would just think an angel could teach this Bible study way better than me. I think you guys would get a lot more out of it once you came too. You know, when, he, when they arrived, they say, like, here it is, Michael the archangel is going to share. And everyone's like, Ugh. We, everyone faints. And we finally, remember the and angel's like, don't be afraid. The first words out of every angel's mouth is fear not. Don't be afraid. Uh, the, the glory, the majesty, from right out of the presence of God. But that's not the mechanism God's chosen. God has chosen, Paul says, like this is through the foolishness of preaching to save. The foolishness of preaching. So he might use a kid. He might use a, one of my favorite testimonies I ever heard was one of the crazy early Calvary Chapel pastors who uh, Pastor at a big church um, in the Long Beach area for many, many years. He's gone to be with the Lord now. His name's Steve Mays. And he was a crazy, crazy drug addict. Kind of had, I think he had robbed some outlaw biker gang and it had been shot by somebody. He was carrying a gun and, and, uh, and had heard about this Christian commune house. And he was kind of hiding from the, from the FBI was after him. The biker gang was after him. And he thought, man, what am I going to do? His parents had kicked him out, and he was kind of living on the street. It hadn't washed for months. And he showed up at this Christian 
they, the, some of the people had donated houses or bought houses so they could have a place because there were so many kids getting saved and they had nowhere to stay. And he shows up at this house, like knocks at the door. And when he tells the story, he, he said, here I am. You know, I got a 45 in my back, back of my pants. I got drugs here. I got a bullet hole here. And I'm like crazy, haven't washed. And he said, this guy opens the door. I forget the guy's name. is like Orville or Eugene or something. If your name is Orville or Eugene, forgive me. But he said, this guy was the biggest nerd. He's got these bottle, Coke bottle glasses, big, like, you know, you need Jesus. And he said, man, that little piss squeak led me to the Lord right there at the front door. Just the gospel. Like, wouldn't it have been better to have, like, I'm Michael the archangel, like, you know, like, pull out his sword and, like, just, just, just humble him. Like, no, just a human being. Maybe the least, the last guy living at that house that you think would be the one that would be sharing with this crazy guy coming off the street. We are ambassadors for Christ, Paul says. Look at it, verse 20. He's committed to us that word of reconciliation. Because we have that ministry, he uses this word in verse 20 to describe us. We are ambassadors. This is the Greek word that means ambassador. Okay, This, this is a person... It's not their message. It's, it's not their position. It's like they're representing somebody else who's important. This is a delegate. This is a person who's been committed by somebody else as their representative to bring that other person's message to the other party. It's not our message. We don't get to change it. We don't get to look at people and go, they don't really like this part, so I'm not going to tell them that part. We just share, share the truth with people. Well, are you saying blah, 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 blah? I remember sharing with these one guys um, many, many years ago when Gene and I were still dating. There was some uh, friends that we had uh, older that uh, she knew, and I was introduced to them, and the guy found out that I was, a, I, was in, I was in college to go into the ministry. And after that, he just kept ha- trying to like, get me to say, he's like, are you saying that all the Jews are going to hell? I was like, dude, I just met you. I didn't say any Jews were going to hell. Like, what? Like, that's kind of, a, you're kind of like trying to jump off the pier. Like, a, like what are you talking about? He was, just trying, he was just trying to bait me into some kind of thing. Like, you know, I would just look at him and go, listen, you got, you, you got some kind of an axe you're trying to grind. Here's what I know. I, I used to not believe in Jesus. My friend told me about Jesus. I accepted Christ and all my sins were forgiven. And I have a relationship with God. I think everybody should have a relationship with God. I don't think God wants to condemn anyone. I think God wants you saved, and I think he wants your wife saved. I think he wants everybody saved. And, and here was this angry person, angry, 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 and trying to, you know, just trying to find some kind of a fight. Like, I'm not going to be baited, but I'm, but I'm not going to not say exactly what God's word says. We have to be, we have to be um, recognizing that we have this amazing and wonderful privilege ambassadors for Christ. So what's your first job, your first ministry to be an ambassador for Christ? If you're married, be an ambassador for Christ for your spouse. After three years of being married to you, your spouse ought to just see the wide open highway, you know, like, oh, I'm so blessed being married to this person. They're an ambassador for Christ. That it's, it has to be uh, number one, as though God, and here's this picture, verse 20, as though God were pleading through us. As though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And there's the message. Be reconciled to God. Now, sometimes you're talking to a person and Jesus said, don't cast your pearls before swine. The picture that somebody, they're not interested. They, they're not in a place where this is meaningful to them. And you say, man, I th- you know, you just need a relationship with Jesus. Bleep, 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 you know, and I don't want that. I don't need that. Like, hey, I'm not condemning you, man. Like, just, you just need to know Jesus died for you, rose from the dead. You can have a relationship. I'm, I'm done with that. Well, I'll be praying for you. Like, well, you can keep your prayers. They're not going to work on me. Well, they will. I'll keep praying. We'll see who wins that battle. The Lord's bigger. Than, I mean, sometimes the door's closed. But there's a lot of people who don't know how to find hope, they don't have any peace, they're filled with anxiety, they don't have hope for the future, they're totally feeling alone, they're not sure God loves them, they're, practic- they're pretty sure God hates them, 
because of how bad they are. And they don't have any idea that God wants them reconciled with him and that he would take them back in a second and that he will forgive them for everything that they ever did and that he's already done all the work and all they need to do is believe in Jesus. We're imploring people. Speaking on behalf of God the Father and we're speaking on behalf of God the Son. And who's helping us? God the Holy Spirit. Remember John chapter 16? I'm going to send the Spirit, Jesus says in John 16, and he says, and he will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment of sin because they don't believe in me. When you're preaching the gospel and your mouth sends out the words and you say, you need Jesus, the Holy Spirit is taking that statement that you made and the Holy Spirit is taking it where your words can't take it right to a person's heart. And he's telling, those, he's telling that person, this is true. You can fight it, but it's true. And you need Jesus. And he can save you. The Holy Spirit is testifying to people in their heart. Now, they may have a face like this. And they may not be listening, or they may do one of these like eyes rolling. They're rolling they can roll their eyes all. You can't. The Holy Spirit's not speaking to their eyes. The Holy Spirit is convicting the world of sin. Jesus said, of sin because they don't believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to the Father. Of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. God takes the gospel message and the Holy Spirit, it becomes the power in the Holy Spirit's hands. The Holy Spirit does the work, but we are the ones who declare it. We declare the message. So we're ambassadors for Christ. Not only does the Holy Spirit do the convicting, but the Holy Spirit gives us the power. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, again, these are this basic concepts, and you guys already know these verses, but this is so important for us. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. The Holy Spirit will give you power to be a witness, and as you're witnessing, the Holy Spirit will take your message, and he will convict people of the truth of the message that you're sharing. He gives you power to do it, and then he takes the message that he gave you, the power to utter, that that he himself is empowered in the first place. So we're on, on the Father's behalf, on the Son's behalf, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. There's the Trinity in our ministry of reconciliation and our as ambassadors of Christ. We are we're speaking on behalf of Christ with his message. Pleading with people, he says, implore you, pleading in verse 22, different verbs, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you to be reconciled to God. And one last point. We went into chapter 6 because this chapter division uh, interrupts the thought. He not only says we're ambassadors, but chapter 6, verse 1, he says, we then as workers together... We're workers. We're ambassadors, but we're also workers. So ambassadors is kind of like you're eating at the five-star restaurant and staying at the Four Seasons and Abu Dhabi or whatever. You know, you're, you came in on the private jet and you're the ambassador and you're being wined and dined. And the workers, that's another picture, isn't it? Like there's more than one picture here. Yeah, we're ambassadors. Yeah, and sometimes we're sleepless and we're fasting and we, the whole list of stuff here in, in chapter six. Labors, sleeplessness, stripes, imprisonments, that doesn't really sound like an ambassador's job. It sounds like a worker's job. So we're workers, but notice it's workers together. My New King James has the words with him in italics. Remember when you're reading your Bible and you see italics? It's not to emphasize it. It's to let you know that those words have been added by the translators so that you'll understand the sense of it, what they think the sense is, but they're not there in the text, origin- in the, literally in the text. So he says, we then... Workers together also plead that you not receive the grace of God in vain. Workers together. So they add the, the two words with him to try to help. Like, well, who are we workers together with? So what's the answer? Who are we workers together with? Do you agree with the New King James? They put the, is it with God? Well, let me, let me just give you, here's your choices. Workers together. We're working together with God. Workers together. We're working together with each other. Those are your two choices. Which one is it? It's probably both, maybe. We're workers together. How many times have our, has our church sent out outreach teams? Teams. Workers together, right? Jesus sent them out two by two. We're, we're in it together. If you're, if, you're, uh, if you're trying to evangelize somebody, tell a friend. 
Tell a friend who you're, pre- tell your friend and say, pray for me. I'm going to go meet my friend. Pray for me tomorrow. Pray for my friend Omar. And pray for my friend Jason. I'm going to try to share the gospel with those two guys tomorrow. Okay, I'm, that's a true story. Pray for Omar. Pray for Jason. For me, tomorrow I'm going to try to share the gospel with the, both of those guys. So together, we're working together. Yeah, I'll be praying for you. See your friend at church. Who can I, who's in your life that you're sharing the gospel with that I can be praying for? Oh, pray for my mom or pray for my coworker. Pray for this person. We're, we're workers together with each other. But guess what? On behalf of God, on behalf of Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit, we're workers together with God. We're his workers. And this last point is urgency. In this context of we have this from God, verse 2 and 3, I'm sorry, verse, just verse 2. He says, in an acceptable time I've heard you, and in the day of salvation I've helped you. He's quoting from Isaiah. And then Paul interprets it. He says, you know, God said that, in the acceptable time I've heard you, in the day of salvation I've helped you. You can think of a lot of Old Testament stories. What's the day of salvation if you're David and Goliath's story? Well, it's the day David fought Goliath. He, the day before that wasn't the day of salvation. It was the day David showed up and killed that guy. Not the day after. It was that day. But Paul says the day of salvation, and Paul now interprets it for us in a new way in this new covenant, this ministry of reconciliation. He says, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. This is important because procrastination is the number one enemy of the gospel for the people listening. If you ever listen to Billy Graham preach the gospel or Greg Laurie or any real gifted evangelist, one of the uh, straw men that they always take out in their message is procrastination. Like, why wouldn't you get right with Jesus tonight? Why would you wait? D.L. Moody, for sure, was famous for that, especially after the Chicago fire. It was the last time he said in his ministry, he told the people the night of the Chicago fire there was a big outreach, and the night of the Chicago fire that claimed many people's lives and burned up the city, he said, we're going to have a meeting tomorrow night. I want you to go home and think about it and come back tomorrow night ready to make your decision for Christ. That's a true story. And that night there was a Chicago fire, and and D.L. Moody after that never said that again. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. It's the enemy for the person that you're sharing the gospel with. So pray, pray, Lord, let this moment be. The, when you're talking to somebody, say, Lord, help them make a decision right now. Don't let them put it off. There's a point where you just, they don't want to, and then you don't force somebody, but you need to go for it. Today's the day. Now's the time. That's what Paul says. Now, behold, he says the behold in front of it. It's like, hey, look. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. It's not only the enemy of the person listening to the gospel, it's the enemy of the person preaching the gospel. Because you'll be there with your friend and you think, it's awkward for me to say something right now. There's other people are listening. I'll talk to them later. And sometimes later never comes. Don't procrastinate. In this context of Paul saying we have the ministry of reconciliation is an exhortation to not procrastinate, to just go for it, and to give people an opportunity to respond and say, well, why wouldn't you just accept Jesus right now? Just That's a great question to ask somebody. Why wouldn't you? What's keeping you from accepting Jesus right now? Well, I need to think about it. Well, if your house was on fire, how long would you have to think about it before you ran out? Like, let's be honest. Like, do you know that God loves you? Well, I think he does. Do you know that you're a sinner? I think you know you're a sinner. Why would you wait? You don't know what's going to happen. You, don't, you need to make a decision for Christ. And ask people and call them. Plead with them. Why would you procrastinate? Because if the Lord's speaking to you right now and you say, I don't want to right now, and you're hardening your heart and you're going to put it off, what if, you're, what if you wake up tomorrow and your heart's harder? And the next time I talk to you, you're less open and you go down a road, who knows what's going to happen. We need, to, we need to preach as though it's our, our last chance. There's an old saying, I think it's the old dead guy saying, uh, preach as a, as a dying man to dying men. I think Spurgeon told the guys in his, in his minister's college, he said, be often where men are dying. It'll help you in your preaching the gospel. <laughs> it's like, well, I mean, if you're living in England in the late 1800s, death came more quickly. The lifespan is much lower. You'd, I mean, if 
we're, we have a COVID epidemic, but compare it to a flu epidemic in the early 1900s or a cholera outbreak in, in London in the 1800s. I mean, you're talking about, you know, crazy loss of life. So this idea that, well, I can just do it later. I'll preach later. I'll accept the Lord later. Paul says, no, today. Today's the day of salvation. So the ministry of reconciliation, reconciled to God, the atonement, and we've been given this message, and it's urgent. So, Father, help us. We pray for the power of the Holy Spirit. We ask you, Jesus, to baptize us afresh and anew with your Spirit. Give us the boldness, Lord, the, the grace. Let our speech be seasoned with grace that we know how to respond to each person. And, Lord, we pray that you'd help us to be uh, wise, that, that when people are saying things to us, Lord, may we have the gifts of the Holy Spirit, that the power of the Spirit to be able to hear what they're really saying and give the answer that they really need to hear. Lord, give us grace and, and power to be uh, good ministers of this new covenant. We're not sufficient of ourselves. Paul's already said it in, our, in this letter, to think of anything as coming from ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. So make us sufficient, Lord. Pour out your Spirit. I pray for all of our friends and family that need to respond to the gospel. We pray in the name of Jesus that your Spirit will convict them of sin and righteousness and judgment and that you'll use us to preach the gospel to many people in these last days. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. And uh, if you would, really remember my friends Omar and, and uh, Jason. I will be seeing them hopefully tomorrow morning. So maybe I'll get a chance to share the gospel. I'm certainly going to act like tomorrow's the day of, day of salvation. So I'll be praying for you. May the Lord use you mightily, and may you have many opportunities. Um, be ready. You might, you might be uh, like that guy Orville or Eugene or whatever his name was that uh, shared with Steve Mays. Just go for it. You're, you're in the right place at the right time if you're the person standing in front of the unbeliever and they're looking at you like, what? They're like, actually, I know the answer to what? God loves you, and he sent his son to die on the cross for your sins, and you can get saved right now. So God bless you. May he use you in Jesus' name. Amen.